Thank you, Tom. My name is Jack, and I am an alcoholic. And uh, I want to thank uh, all of you hearty souls for coming in off the beach this afternoon to spend this time uh, together. When uh, Al uh, called me and invited me, he said we were going to have some spectacular weather. And um, he was right. I don't know what the view is at your room, but at my room it's pretty spectacular. Uh, Tom indicated that there are plenty of restaurants, and that's true. But unless you know somebody around here, they're closed. So, uh, you know, just a, you know, maybe some of you have discovered that already. But, uh, you know, hook up with somebody who's got local knowledge, and they'll, they'll find some place that's open for you. My, uh, my assignment during the time that we're together is to talk about our program of recovery and our uh, 12 traditions. And uh, I'll try to do that. But uh, I think you all know, but I think it's worth saying that I am not an expert on Alcoholics Anonymous, uh, nor am I a spokesperson for Alcoholics Anonymous. And uh, I'm just a guy who lived nearby who could get here by 1.30 on Friday afternoon. <laughs> And uh, I'll try to share my experience, strength, and hope. But the likelihood is that I'll probably weave some opinion, strength, and hope in there. And if I say anything that offends you, uh, talk to Al, because he's the one that invited me. And if I say anything that you... Uh, that you approve of, well, by all means, you know, see me after the meeting, because I really do like those attaboys. And uh, we're going to spend some time together, and then we're going to take a break. And then uh, those of you who return, uh, we're going to pass out door prizes and stuff. Uh, well, maybe not, but you'll have to come back to find out. So, uh, you know, where do you begin? Uh, well, I used to drink, uh, that, uh, and now I don't. And Tom, uh, Tom was kind enough to come over to uh, the airport and pick me up this morning, and uh, I flew in from uh, Baltimore. And uh, I have a new relationship with my higher power. <laughs> I'm a much more spiritual person after the last 15 minutes of the flight. It was one of those flights where the folks... Uh, the passengers gave a standing ovation to the pilot when he came out of the cockpit. And uh, it just it's good to have a new relationship uh, with my higher power. I had no relationship when I got here. And the thing that uh, fascinates me about Alcoholics Anonymous is that this book um, called, surprisingly, Alcoholics Anonymous, uh, turns out to be a true book. That is, the folks wrote it, and it tells the truth about the alcoholic. And that's me, uh, much to my surprise. And um, the fact that the book was written before I was born uh, makes it doubly surprising that they would know so much about me. Uh, I don't know what, it, what it's like in your home group. Uh, maybe when you all have a group conscience meeting, I don't know how many people are in your home group, but let's say for the sake of this discussion that you've got a hundred, uh, like the folks that wrote this book. Uh, the most sober person in the room is three and a half years sober, and uh, then you just go all the way down to, I don't know, maybe 15 days. I, I, I don't know. Uh, but the assignment is for, uh, well, either the 100 folks in your home group or this group of people assembled here this afternoon to sit down and write a chapter for the big book. Just one chapter upon which we can all agree. <laughs> now, I can tell, just looking at you, based on your experience, that that's not going to happen in your home group 
And you're cynical enough to think that it's not going to happen with this group of folks either. And I agree, which makes this book that much more miraculous. So when we talk about the program of recovery, uh, it's the 12 steps. And the, the program is contained in this book, but they neglect to give us very much information about it um, when we get the book. First thing, and I, I know you all know this, but they start off with some opinion by some doctor. And that guy didn't even sign his opinion when this book was published. So what kind of doctor is he? And who cares about his opinion? And then they got this story, you know this, they got this story, this guy Bill, um, he calls himself a stockbroker, but he wasn't. Stock speculator, possibly, but failed miserably. Who cares about him? And he's dead for crying out loud. So there, you know, what is it? War fever ran high. Oh, that's exciting. Yeah, that'll get me, suck me right in. <laughs> I'm a, you'll hear later, I'm, I'm a pretty smart guy. I am uh, very much like you, very intelligent. And, um, I mean, who wants to read more about alcoholism? Who wants to read There's a Solution? Who wants to read about We Antagonists? I mean, we want to we know how it works, right? So that's, I don't know why they made that the fifth chapter, because obviously... That's the information that we need. How does it work? Well, rarely have we seen a person fail who has thoroughly followed our path. Hmm. wonder what they mean by that. Well, we read on and we come to that part about the ABCs. And it says something to the effect that being convinced we're at step three. Well, now I'm confused. Because I know there's 12 steps and there's one and two. What happened to one and two? Where are one and two in this book? How it come I missed it? Where did they hide it? Well, I now know that in the original manuscript, and you probably know this too, that they said if you're not convinced up to this point, go back to the beginning of the book and reread it or throw it away. A lot of truth in that. A lot of wisdom in that. Because if I'm not convinced of the ABCs, I may be convinced if I reread the material up to that point. But if I'm not convinced, and I'm not willing to be convinced, sitting in a chair in a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous isn't going to do me much good. I may as well go back over to the Broad Axe and have do a little controlled drinking. And of course, up to that point, that is the ABCs, it has already been suggested twice in the book that if I have any reservation about being here, then I should go drink. And that sounds like a uh, strange recommendation uh, for an organization that's trying to teach me how to live successfully not drinking. But if you have a reservation, that generally means that I'm going somewhere. And um, I had a reservation to come here today. And uh, by God's grace, I'm here. Now, I did, I did have to take some action beyond making the reservation. But what the, what the book here is saying, I have to embrace this thing without reservation. And um, my guess is that most of you, uh, either through your own personal experience 
or through experience in sponsoring others have encountered that mantra that seems to be popular here in Alcoholics Anonymous, and that is, yell but. <laughs> this is what we'd like you to do, Jack. Well, I'm willing to do it, yeah, but my case is different. You don't understand, I've already explained to you how smart I am, and you don't understand that I am not like you. I'm different from you. And so it is suggested that I go back and reread the book up to this point. Well, they want me to have, first of all, an assessment, an understanding, a working knowledge of what the medical profession's opinion is of my condition. Now, when Dr. Silkworth wrote that doctor's opinion, he was pretty much on his own in that opinion, and I think that's one of the reasons why he didn't sign his name to it, is that he didn't want to be ridiculed by his fellow members of the medical profession, even though what he knew was true and what they knew was zilch. Uh, but the fact remains that nothing has really changed in terms of the medical community's opinion of the disease from which I suffer. It says uh, that if you take alcohol away from me, the alcoholic, I become restless, irritable, and discontented. Um, that's pretty much a gross understatement. Uh, in my case. Um, I really become pissed off in a spring-loaded position is what happens to me. And it says that um, I'm either going to drink again, slow suicide, or I'll make the ultimate sacrifice, fast suicide. Bridge abutment, out a window, hanging, handgun. That's it. In essence, what they're saying is, Jack, either, either accept this diagnosis or bend over and grab your ankles and kiss your ass goodbye. Cause that's it. Yeah, but isn't, isn't there some other? Isn't there some when they say I'm going to die a horrible, painful, alcoholic death, what do they mean by that? <laughs> what? Can I get a lifeline here? Can I make a call? Can I call my doctor and get his opinion of how bad it's going to be? The fact remains that the doctor's opinion in this book is real clear about how bad it's going to be. It's going to be really bad. And um, I can either accept that and go on with the rest of the program, or I can deny it and suffer the consequences of that. So, I, you know, it was suggested that I go back and order to become convinced, reread the material, and this is, of course, one of those areas where it's good to have a sponsor uh, because, in my experience, reading this uh, by myself, I missed a lot of the important stuff. Um, as smart as I am, I tend to read the, the white part of the page and neglect reading the black part. And there's some really good stuff in the black part, but it had to be pointed out to me by my sponsors. So I come here to be convinced. And so I read Bill's story, and one of the things that Bill talks about is visiting Winchester Cathedral, and he says, much moved. I went outside. And then he goes along and tells us that doggerel about the Hampshire Grenadier. But the doggerel about the Hampshire Grenadier is not the important part 
of Bill's story. The important part of Bill's story is much moved. I missed it. I missed it several times. I missed it when it was pointed out to me. <laughs> Maybe you've missed it. I don't know. You might have a big book back in your room. You might want to go back and look. Where is that much moved? It's on the very first page of Bill's story. Well, what's it about? What's it mean? They don't tell us. Very tricky, these alcoholics. Now, they'll tell us later on page 10 and page 12, and they'll mention it back on page 46, but you've got to be alert. You've got to be paying attention. And I read for entertainment. And this book is not for entertainment. This book is written in a peculiar kind of way. This book is a textbook. This book is not something that's been written to convey knowledge. It's been written to convey an experience. And um, Bill tells us, shows us, demonstrates to us, not only through his intellect but through his actions, that self-knowledge is not going to keep me sober. Self-knowledge is not going to keep me sober. I will not live happily and usefully whole on the basis of self-knowledge. Now this is bad news for a smart guy like me because if you're as smart as I am, you know that if you put your mind to it, you can figure it out. Somebody told you that somewhere. Or maybe it just came out of the ether and landed on your head and became knowledge for you. I don't know where you got it, but I don't know where I got it. If you just put your mind to it, Jack, you can figure it out. If you can think your way out of any situation, Jack, and that sometimes works in some areas of my life, it just doesn't work with alcoholism. And that uh, then becomes very frustrating because I think this time it's going to be different. And then, of course, it is different. It's worse. But now, knowing what I know now, this time it's going to be different. And it is. It's even worse than the last time. Early on in Alcoholics Anonymous, I heard it said that insanity is the repeating of an act expecting a different result. Some of you have probably heard that too. Recently, I heard that insanity is joining a 12-step program and not doing the 12 steps. <laughs> I don't know about you, but that really resonates with me. It also uh, describes accurately my experience when I stopped drinking and didn't do any changing. When I stopped drinking and just hung on as best I could not drinking. Um, it's kind of like don't drink and go to meetings. I mean, to tell an alcoholic like me that if I do 90 meetings in 90 days I'll be all right means to me that if I come every day to a meeting and sit in the same chair that at the end of three months I'll be all right. My experience is that about 65 days into that 90 days I am crazy. I am insane. I've got, I've got no coping skills. I don't know how I'm going to get through the day. I mean, in our material, it, t it talks about uh, the spiritual malady being healed first, and I don't know that I've got a spiritual malady. I think I've got a physical problem and maybe a mental problem. I got no understanding of spiritual malady. So, you know, I read Bill's story, and I certainly see the progressive nature of his disease. You know, um, 
He comes back from the war. He goes to school. He studies hard. Though my drinking was not yet continuous, it disturbed my wife. I think she was a little bit more than disturbed. <laughs> My guess is that if given the opportunity to speak at this moment, Lois would have a little bit more to say than Bill's drinking disturbed me. <laughs> I don't know. I think my wife would have had more to say than that. So... I just uh, try to read a little bit between the lines. But Bill, and I think like many of us, had a modicum of success in his life, and he felt, as Bill says, I had arrived. Now, I, it's not my belief that you have to have financial gain to arrive. It may be that it's a relationship it may be that your golf game has improved. It may be that you're running with a different crowd that makes you feel like you had arrived. But I think all of us at some time in our drinking thinking, this is good. I've arrived. It's okay. Uh, the problem with that is, is that is a delusional thought. It's a lie which I have told myself. I believe it to be true, and I act upon it as if it were true, and I crash and burn. And I wonder, how could that possibly be? And Bill says, my drinking assumed more serious proportions, continuing all day and almost every night. We were talking at lunch today about my insistence that I was not a morning drinker. I insisted. I told my sponsors, both of them, I said, I, I have never been a morning drinker. And they said, what time did you leave the broad axe? And I said, when it closed. <laughs> what time did it close? Two o'clock. In the afternoon? No, in the morning. That's a morning drink. No, it's not. It's still dark out. That can't be a morning drink. Now, if you sleep till noon, that poses another problem altogether. Because if I'm getting up at 12.30 or 1 p.m., just because I'm putting a little vodka in my orange juice does not make that a morning drink. That's an afternoon drink because it's 1 p.m. And I can see that a number of you follow the logic of that. It makes perfect sense to me, and I believe it does to some of you, which ought to cause you some concern. But I have, uh, I've read Bill's story and reflected upon what was going on in October 1929, and people literally jumped out windows during the crash of 29. But not our boy Bill. Bill said, uh-uh. He looked at the ticker tapes, he saw the market had crashed, and he went back to the bar. But three years later, in 1932, he has to drag his mattress from the second floor to the first floor because he's afraid he's going to jump out the window. Suicide. I don't know if you all have uh, entertained ideas of suicide or not, but I certainly did. And I begin to see the progressive nature of this in Bill's life, and I also begin to see it in my life, and I begin to see that there was a time in my life when I would never have considered taking my own life, and at the end of my drinking, I very vividly remember sitting in the parking lot of a psychiatrist in Frederick, Maryland, it was June. He told me that I was coping very well. And we were going to take the, the summer off. And that if I felt the need to come back and see him, I should come back after Labor Day. 
And I remember sitting in the parking lot wondering if that was the day that I would go back to my office and shoot myself. Now, granted, I neglected to tell a psychiatrist that. Because I think some of you know, if you tell a psychiatrist something like that, they get real agitated. And it seemed to me, given the amount of money that I was paying that guy an hour, $120 an hour, that if he was any good, he would have figured it out for himself. I mean, he had to earn his money. So later, when I read in the book that doctors have a low opinion of us, why psychiatrists are doctors, and the reason they have a low opinion of us is we seldom tell them the truth. And to be perfectly honest, I never told that guy the truth. I told him the truth to the extent that I was willing to tell him the truth. And the rest of it I withheld. And uh, my life was miserable. And I find out that Bill's life was miserable. And finally, Bill came to that place which we call pitiful and incomprehensible demoralization. And something happened. You know, uh, I listen to a lot of speaker tapes and go to a lot of speaker meetings and invariably I hear the speaker say something to the effect that he cried out to God, God help me. And then the speaker relates a whole series of events that result in help coming. And when I think back over my life and uh, all the... uh, all the times that I had painted myself into a corner where I couldn't get out, where I had no other recourse than to say, God, if you'll just get me out of this, I will never, whatever it was. And then God came. Every 911 prayer I offered up, every single solitary one of them was answered. Now, the answer wasn't necessarily the answer that I was looking for but it was the answer that allowed the crisis du jour to pass and of course I would take full credit dodged another bullet you know pretty pretty smart pretty agile skated out of that situation and uh, went back to doing whatever it is I was doing but the reality was that the prayers were answered. And I had no idea. And so, you know, Bill, I mean, this is an exciting time. Now this is, today is the 13th of November, so Bill has been drinking now for two days on his last jag. He started November the 11th, 1934. Bill's last debauch. And God is moving. And uh, Bill doesn't know it. Uh, and uh, you know most people wouldn't be aware of it but uh, God has already brought the Oxford movement to Akron, Ohio uh, put in place uh, all the structure necessary we read from Dr. Bob's nightmare that he's been going to the Oxford meetings for two and a half years drinking every night so tonight Friday night November 13th, 1934, Dr. Bob's going to be drinking. Bill's going to be drinking. He's drinking in New York. Bob's drinking in Ohio. When did Akron become a western city, by the way? Um, I think that may be a matter of perception. Apparently, in 1934, Akron was a western city. Um, At least they say so, but I digress. Um, exciting things are going on. Um, Ebby, Bill's friend, who he's known for a long time, drinking buddy, 
fact, they were the first people to land an airplane in Manchester, New Hampshire. Huh? And they were also the first drunks to fall out of an airplane in Manchester, New Hampshire. <laughs> but the fact remains that that was one of Ebby's and Bill's most remarkable jags. And Ebby, Ebby is not drinking. Uh, I'm not exactly sure what happened, but it sounds as if Roland, who had been over there with Dr. Young and had gotten spent a year, I bet that costs a lot of money. If Betty Ford costs whatever it costs for 30 days, can you imagine what Carl Young must have cost? And they didn't do 30 days with Carl. He did a year. And then on the way home, somebody said, Roland, would you like a drink? And he said, Sure. And back he went. But Roland was told by Dr. Young that, you know, this, uh, this treatment that we're trying to manifest in you has not worked. You've got all the knowledge you need. But what you need, what I would like to try to reproduce in you and I'm not capable of doing, is give you a spiritual experience which will relieve your alcoholism. And Roland left Dr. Young, went back to New York, and joined the Oxford Movement. And had that spiritual awakening and never drank again. And then he befriends or helps a guy up in uh, Vermont who's got a bit of a drinking problem. And then they find out that Ebby ran into this house while drunk with his car and the judge was going to put him in jail and I believe that I believe that Roland had befriended the judge's son and had gotten the judge's son sober they went down to see the judge and says if we would take this guy back to New York and not have him up here in New England would you not put him in jail and the judge said well if you come back I'll put you in jail and so Ebby went down to New York and now Ebby's sober in New York Bill's drunk, Roland's sober, Dr. Bob is drunk, the Oxford Movement's in New York, the Oxford Movement's in Akron, all the pieces are in place. And Bill has been sober up until Armistice Day, that's what November 11th used to be before it became Veterans Day. And as you probably know, he, and he was going out to play around the golf he had taken his golf clubs and had gotten on a bus where he struck up a conversation with a guy who got on the bus with a rifle uh, obviously times have changed <laughs> but because Bill was in the army he struck up a conversation the guy was on his way to a shooting range to shoot his rifle and Bill's going to go play some golf and the bus breaks down and they go into the American Legion and they're going to have a bite to eat. And at the 11th hour of the 11th day, the bartender says, drinks are on the house. And Bill says, I think I'll have one. And his newfound friend, who he tried to buy him a drink, and Bill said, no, thank you. I am you know, explained everything to him. And then took the free drink offered by the bartender. And the guy says, you must be crazy. And Bill says, I am. I am. Now, there wasn't any 12-step program for Bill to join, like there is for you and me. But one might ask themselves, just how crazy am I to be in a 12-step program, and I'm not doing the 12 steps? I'm pretty crazy, is what I am. So, Abby goes to uh, give away to Bill what has been so graciously given to him. Uh, Bill is not buying it. He's not, he's not interested in it. Um, he says, nope, not doing that. Abby leaves. Bill continues to drink. But then Bill gets to thinking. And, you know, we're thinkers. I can tell there's some thinkers in here this afternoon. Oh, there's one over there. Yeah. <laughs> there's thinkers in here. We're not good at it, but we do a lot of it. And he thought, well, maybe I'll go down there 
and see what's going on there with Ebby. And so he goes, uh, heads down that way, but he stops in a couple bars. He strikes up an acquaintance with a new friend, a Norwegian fisherman. They both get pretty drunk. And they go down to see Ebby in the uh, Oxford meeting, and they ask uh, folks who want to come down front to be saved, and Bill goes down front to be saved, and he uh, gives them a little talk, and... Uh, Goes back, uh, goes back home, continues to drink. And then decides, well, maybe he ought to go back to Towns Hospital. And he does go back to Towns Hospital, and that's where he has his white flash experience. And uh, Ebby comes back to see him. And I think Ebby brought him William James's Varieties of Spiritual Experiences. And I think Bill says he read it through. I bought a copy of William James' Varieties of Spiritual Experiences. I can get past page five. That's a hard book to read. I don't think I was willing to go to any length is what I think, but, but Bill read it. And Bill's sober. He's not drinking. He's going to the Oxford groups. He's trying to help other people. He's pulling them off of bar stools, bringing them home. I'm sure Lois really liked this period. And uh, things aren't going well, he thinks. And he complains to Lois, I'm not getting anybody sober. And uh, she says, well, you're not drinking. Everybody in here is sponsoring somebody? Sponsoring two or three people. As Bill's story says, if the alcoholic doesn't grow his spiritual condition through work and self-sacrifice for others, he will not survive. It doesn't say that we have to be successful in our work and self-sacrifice for others. It just says we need to try. And it doesn't say we have to be attending our home group for a year before we can sponsor anybody. Uh, it would appear that Bill began to work with others immediately upon his having had his last drink. And we know later that Dr. Bob did not call Bill. We know that, right? Dr. Bob did not call Bill. Well, if that guy wants to get sober, he knows where I am. He can call me. Uh-uh. Bob did not call Bill. If I want to save my ass, and that thought drops into my mind, I wonder how Fred's doing. Well, if he wants to get sober, he knows my number. I need to be calling Fred. Because that thought did not drop into my mind randomly. I've learned in Alcoholics Anonymous, that's an intuitive thought. When somebody's name comes into my mind, not as a result of progressive thought by me, but just poof, out of nowhere, that's God speaking. And I can ignore the voice of God at my peril, or I can pick up the phone and call. Now, I'm sure there are people in this room who have done just that, picked up the phone and called. Not necessarily the guy who is out of, of struggling, obviously struggling, continuing to drink, go to meetings, continuing to drink. Maybe it's just somebody's name that drops in. You know, that guy with 15 years and his name drops into your head and you call him up and uh, just talk. How you doing? Good talking to you. Just thinking about you. And then six weeks or six months later, he says, You know, Fred, when you called a couple weeks ago, I was really down in the dumps. And that call of yours just lifted me up. How does that happen? It's because we are, we are taught to listen for that still, small voice, which is God. But I have to be willing to listen. And so we know that Bill, if not literally, figuratively, did our 12 steps during that last hospitalization at Towns Hospital. 
and got out and started trying to help other people. And um, Bill has a peculiar way of saying some things. Uh, he says, an alcoholic in his cups is an unlovely creature, particularly when they're thrown up in your car. <laughs> Our struggles with them are variously strenuous, comic, and tragic. One poor chap committed suicide in my house. There is, however, a vast amount of fun about it all. Now, I haven't had anybody commit suicide in my house. You may have had that experience. But that's what happens to some of us. Obviously, some of us die so that others of us can live. And there is a vast amount of fun about it all. And, we don't, and I, I did not know that. Because I'm looking for the solution. I'm looking for the cliff notes. I'm looking for the abridged program of recovery of Alcoholics Anonymous. I'm looking for the fast track. I'm looking for the quick, down and dirty answer. And they say, well, if you want to know what the solution is, Jack, the solution is a vital spiritual experience. Great. How do I get that? We'll tell you later. Whoa, why not now? Well, before we tell you now, we want to tell you a little bit about the peculiar thinking that precedes drinking. Well, what kind of thinking is that? That's the kind of thinking that they outlined for us and more about alcoholism. I had to read this thing a number of times before I figured out that the people in more about alcoholism are all sober people. There's even like a cartoon thing over there about putting whiskey in milk. That's a sober thought. <laughs> Nobody was drinking at that moment before the whiskey hit the milk. That's sober thinking. That's, that's, what, that's a representation of my best thinking. Like our friend Jim. We remember Jim. Now, personally, I like to think that Jim, that car dealership that he drank away, that he continued to work for, I like to think that that was a Cadillac dealership as opposed to a Yugo dealership. I mean, I think, you know, I think uh, top flight, ostentatious. But I, I cannot bring myself to figure out how it is that if I drank away a Cadillac dealership that I'd even be willing to work there. But he was working there. Had to be humiliating. I mean, you got the big office and you're the boss. And now you got one of those little salesman offices. And you got to take all your deals to the finance manager. You got no authority. He went into work on Tuesday. What happened to Monday? Had a few words with the boss. I think the words that he had with the boss is, where the hell were you on Monday? <laughs> Nothing serious, says Jim. I wonder what the boss thought of that. I kind of think that Jim probably went out the door giving the boss the bird. <laughs> I'm going out, I'm going down the road to a tavern, going to scare up, a, 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 a car sale down there. Sure, that's where all car sales are done. Taverns. No point in hanging around on the lot where you can actually show somebody a car. Better to go to a bar and wait for somebody to come in. Jim, and I'm, I'm not real sure about this, but I think Jim... had six different contacts with the A&A &A people. He would get drunk, he'd go to a jitter joint, they'd spin him dry, he'd come out, meet with the AA -A people, they would encourage him to enlarge his spiritual life. He said, no, I'm doing good, thank you very much. He'd get drunk, go into the jitter joint, get spun dry, get out, meet with the A&A -A people, refused to enlarge his spiritual life. 
I'm doing fine. Thank you very much. Get drunk. Go to the spin dry place. Get out. Meet with the A and A people. They asked him to enlarge his spiritual life. He refused. He'd hang on. Get drunk. Go back to the jitter joint. Get spun dry. Come out. Meet with the A and A people. They tell him to enlarge his spiritual life. He'd say, I'm doing fine. You don't understand. He'd get drunk, go to the jitter joint, get spun dry, come out, meet with the a and people. They'd tell him, enlarge your spiritual life. He'd say, you don't understand. My case is different. And then he got drunk yet again, which is when he put the milk or the whiskey in his milk. That was the product of his very best thinking after being spun dry six times and having met with him a and people. Could have been seven times. Might have been the eighth time. So from the jump, we got people, myself included, who when given the opportunity to embrace a program that's going to render me happily and usefully whole, said, you don't understand. My case is different. And Jim damn near died. Now, my most favorite guy in all of the big book, with all due deference to the people whose stories are in the back, and with all deference to Dr. Bob and to Bill, I just really, really am fond of the jaywalker. I mean, just mentioning the jaywalker gets my adrenaline revving up. Because I can, I mean, could, can you imagine if we would just went outside this afternoon in the rain and the, and the wind and the wet and, and, just, I mean, and just dashed out between parked cars? I mean, it wouldn't have to be an ambulance or a fire truck. Just a regular guy coming down the street with his windshield wipers going flap, 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 and we wait till we got real close and run out. Doesn't that sound exciting? I mean, I'm excited about that. In fact, during the break, if you don't see me around, I may be down there on the street. Because I love the jaywalker. But I have this, uh, this thing they talk about, this lack of proportion of the ability to think straight. I'm not good at thinking. And um, like the jaywalker, just because I got a leg broke or my skull fractured, that doesn't mean I'm going to stop having fun. I mean, just because the last time I got drunk I damn near died doesn't mean I'm going to quit drinking. I might quit drinking scotch. <laughs> or I might give up gin but I'm not going to quit drinking. Now Fred, Fred is a little bit more, um, he's more of a high bottom drunk, as we're fond of saying these days. But he ended up in the hospital. And again, they called him and a guys over. And um, they wanted him to accept a spiritual remedy for his problems. And he said, no. Based upon what you have told me, based upon what I know now, I'm not going to drink anymore. And he fared forth. And he didn't drink. Until he drank. And he ended up back in the hospital again. And them A and A's came and talked to him, and he explained to them what happened as he explains it to us. And of course, what happened was is he refused to enlarge his spiritual life, and he got drunk. And he says the program of action, though entirely sensible, was pretty drastic. I would have to throw several lifelong conceptions out the window. The discovery that spiritual principles would solve all my problems. Not that spiritual principles would solve some of his problems, that spiritual principles would solve all of his problems. 
That sounds really good, although I don't know if I'm buying that or not. Because I don't have any experience. And this is an experiential program. This is not an intellectual program. I'm thinking this book has been written to impart knowledge to me. When in fact it's been written to impart an experience to me. I'm thinking that, that this book is just to be read and to gain the knowledge. And it says right on the dust jacket of the hardback, it's a textbook. Which I've come to understand means it's to be read and applied and experienced and reread and reapplied and re-experienced and reread and reapplied and re-experienced. And the more that I do that, the more that I will learn and the more that I will grow in effectiveness and understanding. I didn't know that before I did it. Well, could you now tell me how to get a vital spiritual experience? Not yet, Jack. Don't rush us. We want to talk to you about God. <clears throat> Some of us grew up in a church. I grew up in a church. Like Dr. Bob, I said, as soon as I get old enough not to come back here, I ain't coming back. And the book says many of us at an early age closed the door on God. I thought I was the only one. I didn't know that other people would close the door on God. I didn't know that the folks that wrote this book had experienced the self-same things that I'd experienced. I had no idea. None whatsoever. Now they say in our book, they give us these tests. And it's at the beginning of this chapter that they suggest to me that I could be alcoholic if I cannot take a couple of drinks and stop. Or, having stopped, I can't stay stopped. Now this is bad news for an alcoholic of my type. And I would suggest it was probably bad news for you when you first encountered it because they seem to know what they're talking about. How many times did I sit on the edge of my bed saying, i got to cut this out. <sighs> Something's got to be done. On Monday, I'm turning over a new leaf. On Monday, we're going to start a new way of life. Now, I'm saying this on Saturday morning. Well, why don't I just start on Saturday morning? Because I don't want to overreact. <laughs> and besides, I have plans for Saturday night, and you taper off on Sunday. So Monday's when you get started. To be doomed to an alcoholic death or to live on a spiritual basis are not always easy alternatives to face. We had to face the fact that we must find a spiritual basis of life or else. Or else what? Well, I don't know. Or else. Hmm. Extreme sacrifice. Die. Power to kill. If a mere code of morals or a better philosophy of life were sufficient to overcome alcoholism, many of us had recovered long ago. And if it was all about the drinking, Nancy Reagan would have been right. Just say no. That's it. No need to gather up. No pockets of enthusiasm. Just say no until we say yes. <laughs> and therein lies the rub. Because <clears throat> while I am perfectly capable of saying no, I can't say no consistently. And then I say yes. And then, you know, I come to Alcoholics Anonymous. And as I mentioned, sitting on the uh, 
edge of my bed wondering if I have a problem with alcohol. And as you know, but I did not know, that the only people who wonder if they have a problem with alcohol are those of us who have a problem with alcohol. For people who don't have a problem with alcohol, it just doesn't come up. And I'm amazed at that because I thought everybody at one time or another sat on the edge of their bed and wondered if they had a problem with alcohol. And they don't. There's only about 10% of us that do, more or less. And the ones that do are people who have a problem with alcohol. Now we say that, but we know that it's not alcohol that's the problem. The problem for the alcoholic centers in the mind. But when I'm getting here, or new here, that kind of nuance is just a little beyond me. What I'm really interested in is learning how to drink like a gentleman. And I think you folks probably have got the best chance of teaching that to me. So I don't have to come here for the right motives, whatever they are. But I come here because of what the book describes as pitiful and incomprehensible demoralization. And we know back, uh, we'll read back in uh, AA number three story that uh, Bill and Bob, when they went to see uh, AA number three, there were really just a couple of questions. Like, do you want to quit drinking? No. Goodbye. <laughs> well, on second thought, yeah, I want to quit drinking. Do you think you can quit on your own? Yeah. Goodbye. Because if I think I can quit on my own, Bill and Bob don't want anything to do with me. Uh, -uh I can't quit on my own. I've been in this hospital eight times in six months. I got drunk on the way home the last time. No, I don't think I can quit on my own. Oh, okay. Do you believe in God? No, I don't. Bend over, grab your ankles, kiss your ass goodbye, because uh, you're doomed. There's no hope. Well, I'm willing to believe, well, that's good enough. On that slender reed, we can get started. Are you willing to go to that power greater than yourself and ask for help? No. Goodbye. Well, wait a minute. I'll reconsider my answer. Yes, I'm willing to go to that power. Okay, then we're ready to get started. Get started, what are we going to do? Well, here is a program of recovery. It consists of 12 steps. And it is suggested to you. Well, okay. But it also says that they're going to give us detailed directions. That doesn't sound like suggestions. In fact, there only seem to be one set of suggestions. And as you know, there is that eternal quest of the recovering alcoholic to find the easier, softer way. But we could not. With all the earnestness at our command, we beg of you to be fearless and thorough from the very start. You ever have anybody beg you? to plead with you for your own sake, for God's sake, Jack. Come along with us and do what we do. Ken and Bob did that with me. They did it week in, week out, month in, month out. But I'm, a, I'm an intellectual knucklehead, and I'm going to figure this thing out. And they got a program of action that absolutely works. And it says, being convinced, we're at step three. And what is step three? A simple prayer. A simple prayer. I don't like praying. It's okay. Don't have to like it. I don't think prayer works. No problem. You don't have to think it works. You just have to do it. I don't like praying. You don't have to like it. You just have to do it. Well, I don't think it's going to work for me. You don't have to think it's going to work for you. 
All you have to do is do it. Well, of course, the most amazing thing is, which most of you know, is that once I do it, it works for me. No matter what I think. You see, Alcoholics Anonymous is not interested in what I think. As a matter of fact, you know as well as I do, if you want to scare the hell out of your sponsor, just call him up and tell him, Hey, sponsor, I've been thinking. <laughs> when those guys do that to me, I mean, it's like Fred Sanford at the junkyard. Oh, my God, Elizabeth, this is the big one. You know. Whew. Man, newcomer thinking. That'll send you around the bend. Oh. A simple prayer. That's all. Just a simple prayer. This is where, of course, we encounter the famous three frogs. Three frogs sitting on a log. One decides to jump off. Jack, how many frogs sitting on the log? <laughs> Two. You're not listening, Jack. <clears throat> three frogs sitting on the log. One frog decides to jump off. How many frogs sitting on the log? Two. Let me repeat this for you, Jack, because you're missing something here. Three frogs sitting on the log. One frog decides to jump off. How many frogs sitting on the log? Look, Bob, <clears throat> my answer is not changing. Now, maybe I'm missing something here, but I'm a pretty bright guy. I mean, I, I'll dazzle you later with my brilliance, but two is my answer. The answer is three, Jack. The frog has made a decision and taken no action. And here we are, poised on the threshold of the program of recovery of Alcoholics Anonymous. I've been asked to review my life as best I can, trying to see if I have thought or felt things that Bob felt or thought, if I experienced things that have been outlined by the doctor that alcoholics experience. If I've had those kinds of things, experiences in my life that are described and more about alcoholism as peculiar mental blank spots where I have sworn I'm not drinking again and yet thing you know I'm drinking by, by noon. Have, have those things happened to me? Have I been trying to compare out or compare in? Have I asked myself these questions? This, did this happen to me? Did I feel this? Did I experience that? When I honestly look at what has been laid out in front of me, these first four chapters in the doctor's opinion, then I'm ready because I belong here. And they tell me that uh, we're going to get into action. We're going to launch out on a course of vigorous action, the first step of which is a personal house cleaning the first step of which. Now when you go out to play golf, I don't think you go out to play three holes. I don't know, maybe you do, but I think a golf course is 18 holes. You could play nine if you're short on time, but most people don't go for three. Many of us in AA go for the AA waltz. One, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, and we waltz ourselves right into slow suicide drinking, fast suicide bridge abutment. We are poised. We're going to launch. Anybody see one of those space shuttle launches on TV? I mean, there's a lot of heat going on there. There's a lot of action there. There's a lot of noise when you launch. My response to this is, <clears throat> I'd like to rest here. I think I'm pretty much uh, exhausted. I've done quite a bit already, you understand. And besides, I heard people over at that group across town, I heard them say that you ought to be here a year before you start taking the steps. I heard them say that I should wait until I am comfortable before I start taking those steps. I hope they don't say that at your home group, because you're going to end up in a casket. Uh, that's how comfortable you're going to be. You know, it says that if you want what we have, yes, and are willing to go to any length to get it, yes, 
then you're ready to take certain steps. That's it. Now, if you got that when you come through the door, then you're ready to take certain steps. If you got that after you've read the doctor's opinion in the first four chapters, then you're ready to take certain steps. If you don't have it, then reread the book up to this point. And if upon rereading it, you can say, yes, I want what you have, and yes, I'm willing to go to the lens to get it, then you're ready to take certain steps. And if not, go over to the broad axe and get a drink. Because <laughs> you hang out in here, you're going to be miserable, and you're going to try to make the rest of us miserable. Because misery loves company. And there'll be a bunch of people that'll hang out with you. Drinking bad coffee and smoking cigarettes and telling you how miserable they are so you can tell them how miserable you are. And you just as soon go over to the broad axe and do that. So we're going to launch out on a course of spiritual action. Why? Because our decision, our third step decision, is vital and crucial. But it's not going to have any permanent effect unless followed in a few days, unless followed after Thanksgiving, <laughs> unless followed at the beginning of next year, unless at once followed by a strenuous effort to face and be rid of the things in ourselves which have been blocking us. We've got to get down to causes and conditions. A, a business that doesn't take inventory is going to fail. I mean, it says that. Now, I brought along, this is just something I pulled out of, the, out of a newspaper somewhere. I'm not even sure what newspaper anymore. Oh, the Baltimore Sun. Um, this is uh, Macy's. Macy's is having a big sale. 40 to 75% off. Plus, if you cut this coupon out, you'll get another 20% off. Well, what's that mean? That means that if you go over to Macy's and you get yourself an item that used to cost $100, it's already marked down to $25. 75% off. And if you cut this coupon out, they'll take another 20% off, another $5. You'll get it for $20. bucks, 80 percent off. Now, does Macy's do this because they are a benevolent association? That they're nice guys who are just trying to help us out? No. They're doing it because they tried to sell it to us for 100 bucks and we weren't biting. And they have got tractor trailer loads of stuff on the way to Macy's store. And they have a finite amount of shelf space and if they don't get rid of if they don't get rid of the stuff that they can't sell for a hundred bucks and they can't get you and me to buy it for twenty bucks you know what they're going to do with it? They're going to sell it to the rag pickers because they gotta get rid of it so they can free up space for the good stuff that's coming and God has good stuff coming for me and I am chock-a-block full of the accumulated experiences of my life. And I got no room for good stuff. I've got an inventory full of stuff that doesn't work, but it's my stuff. Doesn't work, but it's my stuff. Now maybe you got some stuff. Now your stuff's not as good as my stuff. Well, I know you think it's good stuff, but it's not. And my stuff, I think, is good stuff, and it's not. So what are we going to do? Well, we've got to do something. And it says we're going to take inventory. Well, what are we going to inventory? We're going to inventory self in its most common manifestations. In Fellowship Hall in Hagerstown, they have written, posted on the wall, three columns of nine different things which says character defects for use in your four-step inventory. I don't know where they got that. Serenity has a, bla uh, a brass plaque that's got 28 character defects. And you'd be amazed the number of people who travel back and forth 
between Fellowship Hall and Serenity trying to figure out what character defects Serenity has that Fellowship Hall doesn't have. <laughs> but none of these things appear in the big book. Now, <clears throat> we're going to take a break, and when we come back, we're going to talk about inventorying the common manifestations of self. And I hope that some of you come back, because otherwise I'll be really lonely. <laughs> Thanks for letting me share. <laughs> 